Okay, this video is about how to use common sense and logic to answer nutrition questions. Because I get all kinds of comments from viewers like, you know, how could I contradict some other famous nutrition person? And the reason you see me contradicting people is because I'm right and they're wrong. Okay, and let's just, you know, explain why that is the case. I'm going to start with some basic stuff. Okay, you see this lady right here. She's got breasts and she's got a Virginia. It's rather obvious, okay? She is a female. When an animal is born, we don't ask the animal, what gender would you like to be? If it's got a Johnson, it's a boy. If it's got a Virginia, it's a girl, okay? And now, here's a soy plant. Um, where's the breasts? I don't see any. Where's the Virginia? I don't see any. Okay, we're going to come back to that question in just a moment, all right? That's going to be an important point, part of logic, okay? All right, so now we'll start out with, we'll start out with this deductive logic. Oh, when you think of deductive logic, you think a lot about Aristotle, okay? You know, and the typical thing is a syllogism. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. With deductive logic, you have complete information. You simply have to use the information you already have, and you will be provided with the truth. Okay, deductive logic is also called predator logic. If I'm running after the chicken, if I intersect it at a 45-degree angle going this speed, I shall catch the chicken. Okay, and I also joke in nutrition business, there's liars, there's lazies, uh, ignoramuses just because they're lazy, there's dummies just because they're stupid, and then there's people who tell you the truth and know what they're talking about. And there's actually a lot of liars who tell you the truth about 60%, 70%, even 80% of the time to get your confidence and stuff, and then they sell you some nonsense or they lie to you about something really important, okay? Um, they tell you idiotic stuff and they pretend it's true, and you they've got your trust, so you trust them, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, I answer to Christ. I have no sponsors, okay? <laughs> I don't get any money. People are scared to even talk to me, okay? Because I tell the truth too much. They, that makes them nervous, okay? Uh, I'm doing this because somebody needs to do it. It's pathetic. I feel sorry for the pros. The pros are really screwed. The pros are screwed in 10 different ways. I feel sorry for them. And I'm really a pro myself. I'm just a smart pro. Um, okay, let's go. Now, let's give an example of that. Now, for example, if you go on the internet, you're going to see all kinds of BS artists tell you that caffeine is good for you and coffee is good for you. Okay, and I'll give you one example. There's a guy by the name of Matthew Walker. He's like the most famous sleep expert, okay? And he'll sit there and say, oh, having a couple cups of coffee is okay. He prefers decaf, even though decaf also has caffeine. And so that's an obvious lie. It's obviously untrue. Why would somebody say that? Okay, the reason he says it is because if he wants to continue to be the world's biggest expert on sleep, he wants to be interviewed on channels, all right? If you say coffee is bad for you, caffeine is bad for you, you won't get interviewed anymore. Remember, McDougal got fired from radio and TV shows when he said that supplements are not needed, okay? If you contradict what big money wants, they will block you. That's just a fact, okay? So my prediction about Matthew Walker. Well, actually, I like him, and he is a bright guy, and he does say a lot of smart things, but I'm telling you, I think that's why he says coffee and caffeine are not such a big deal, and there's other famous nutrition doctors out there, as many of you know, if you keep track of all the nutrition videos, that'll sit there and tell you coffee and caffeine are good for you, and tea is good for you, and I'm telling you, I think that's nonsense, okay, because it raises the exact same hormones as stress, you know, cortisol, which suppresses your immune system, makes you fat, raises your blood lipids, and catamol catecholamines, that's adrenaline, noradrenaline, you know, norepinephrine, epinephrine, okay? These things raise your blood pressure, they increase your blood cholesterol, they increase your blood glucose level, they cause insomnia, they increase your risk of atrial fibrillation, the catecholamines are cerebral vasoconstrictors, decrease blood supply to your brain. It's obvious that excessive stress is bad for you, it's obvious that sleep deprivation is bad for you, that increase these same hormones. Why would caffeine be good for you? It's not, this is bullshit, okay? And so you shouldn't even have to ask me. It's okay to ask me. You know, I don't mind because people always ask me, well, so-and-so said caffeine is good for you. And my answer would be, well, I'm right and he's wrong, okay? And the reason I'm right is because of this. It's obvious deductive logic. Okay, now we're going to come back to, we're going to come to inductive logic. Inductive logic is, here, I'll just shrink myself here. Inductive logic is where you don't have complete information, where you have to work from incomplete information and you look for increased 
amounts of clues to give you confidence in your conclusion. And this is the logic of prey. The prey looks around and says, oh, I heard a noise. I heard a twig break in the grass over there. Um, the birds have all gone quiet over there. I think maybe there's a lion coming. I better you know, flee from this location. So then consilience is a very useful word. Consilience means you have several different lines of thought. So here's one line of thought, and it's pointing in this direction, okay, or that direction. Let me see if I can keep it in my webcam. Then there's another line of thought, and it also points in that direction. Then there's another line of thought. I'm trying to get my fingers to show here. I can't even make it work. There's another line of thought points in that direction. Each one is small. Another one, and another one. They're all pointing in the same direction, and each line of thought by itself is small. But when you add them all up together, and they're all pointing in the same direction, they're, lo they're logically consistent. That makes you think, gee, this conclusion is probably true. So it increases your strength, your confidence in that conclusion. I made up a little saying here. Consilience increases resilience of conclusion. So let's talk about soy. A lot of people are attached to soy for emotional reasons. A lot of people are stupid. That's why they think soy is a good food. A lot of people, including some of the most famous smart people in the nutrition world, are liars and they tell you soy is a good food. A lot of other people are like political about it. They don't want to say anything bad about it because they know when you criticize soy, you piss off a lot of people. Big money has a lot of money invested in soy. There's a lot of people who for a living, all they do is lie about soy, okay? It's a billion dollar food product. It's used to feed cattle. It's used, I believe, to you know, make uh, the typical pro fat, sick, and stupid, and infertile. Okay, so why, why could I say that? How could I be so confident to say bad things about soy when all these famous, you know, famous experts say it's good? Okay, number one, it's high fat, 37 to 40% of calories from fat. All high fat foods increase your likelihood you're going to be obese. Okay, as McDougal said, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. It just goes to storage. And a lot of it's omega-6 fat, the so-called inflammatory bad fats, even though all fats are bad. Um, but... It's a high fat food, so it's gonna increase your tendency towards insulin resistance. It's gonna increase your tendency towards Yamashi Yamashima, you know, the Japanese neuroscientist guy of lipid peroxidation, ferroptosis, all this bad stuff. Um, you know, the calpain uh theory of destruction of neurons, destruction of beta cells, predisposing to diabetes. It's all bad, okay? High fat foods are associated with obesity, with diabetes, and increased cancer risk. And I know there's some controversy about what is the actual risk with regard to um, cancer. Some papers say it lowers your risk of breast cancer. Other ones say it increases your risk of breast cancer. Um, you know, I doubt it's doing anything good, but I, I'm, a, I'm aware that there's two schools of thought in that. A lot of times what happens is you look at the old papers when people just wanted to figure out the truth and they're more reliable. The modern papers tend to be funded by industry and they're always going to promote these. You know, there's a bodyguard of lies, as Winston Churchill said, around a lot of things. And there's always going to be a bodyguard of lies around any profitable food. Okay, so what else about soy? It's like thousands of times more estrogenic than almost all the other foods, okay? And I've said before, anything that estrogenic, it would have to do my laundry, cook for me, and please me in bed before I would want anything to do with it, okay? It's off the charts many thousands of times more estrogenic than other foods, okay? It's been shown in papers to cause premature puberty, okay? It's been shown to activate both the alpha and the beta estrogen receptors. So a lot of times they'll try to tell you it only activates the good estrogen receptor, not the bad estrogen receptor. Bullshit. The stuff on the Mueller paper showed it activated both of them about the same amount, okay? And like I said, soy plants don't have a breast. They don't have a Virginia. So why do they want their estrogen level so well, so high? Well, let's talk about it. If a bear eats a bunch of berries and then he walks two miles down the road and takes a poop, he's making a new berry plant, okay? On the other hand, some plants don't want to be eaten. And what do you, what's, what's the birth control pill? A thionyl ester dihol, an estrogenic chemical, because estrogen levels are high when a woman is pregnant and gets her to help stop helps us get her to stop ovulating, okay? Make her infertile. Okay, so what's my point? Isn't it obvious? So I don't want to be eaten. And it puts tons of estrogen into its um, it beans and whatnot so that the person can be made infertile, okay? It lowers male sperm counts. It lowers male testosterone. It damages, it, it decreases thyroid production. It's goitrogenic, okay? So wouldn't that make sense? It's a pesticide because it's trying to, to make the animal that eats it infertile or sick so it'll stop eating it, okay? Well, I'm just telling you, use your brain. 
Um, you have to use a little logic here and you have to not be tricked by industry studies. You know, industry studies, I told you, you know, that uh, lady, I like her, she's nice and I think she's a good surgeon, but I think she was lazy when she read about, so what's her name? Christy Funk, you know, the cute little breast surgeon. Okay, when she quoted this paper going, oh, look, it's not estrogenic, it's not goitrogenic, it's not any of these bad things. The paper was written by the guy who's the head of the soy, like, institute, okay? You got to look for bias in papers. Whenever something's industry funded, it's always going to praise their product. Otherwise, they wouldn't publish the paper. You know, it's a business for them. It's not the pursuit of truth. Okay, what else about soy? It's been associated with damage to the female reproductive tract. It's been associated with increased risk of fibroids, associated with increased risk of abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, it raises insulin-like growth factor a significant amount, like especially like the soy protein isolates. That might increase cancer rates. Usually other things that increase insulin-like growth factor are associated with that. Um, it's usually GMO. Who the heck knows what the GMO effect is on the person's health? Probably bad. I'm sure nothing good will come from that. Um, it's sprayed typically with GP, glyphosate. That, that is harmful to human health in about at least 20 different ways. Uh, Stephanie Seneff has given tons of lectures on that, written an entire book on that subject called Toxic, You Know What, Legacy. It's typically often... Pro process with hexane. That's a neurotoxin. That's great. Soy beverages are associated with increased concentration of fluoride. That's another neurotoxin. Isn't that great? So let's see. You've got all these things. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. More than seventeen bad things it does. So how could it be so good? You know, is it, is it going to make you 18 years old again? I don't think so. It's a joke, okay? It's for it's a chump con job for idiots, okay? So this is how you use inductive logic. You add up all these little things and you say, well, gee, it does so many bad things, some of them potentially quite significant. How could it ever do anything good enough? And what about those skinny little Asians who eat some soy? They grow a little bit in their backyard and they eat it on process, just a tiny amount, and it's not able to do much damage in that context. So anyways... This was a quick summary of deductive logic, inductive logic to help protect you from getting chumped. Hope it helps.